Hey everybody, welcome to the channel, True Crime Stories. If you're new to the channel, please hit that like button and subscribe so you can hear more. Thanks for stopping by. These two stories, I wanted to include them in one video together because I wanted to show the contrast of the lives of these people that go missing or get murdered or um, these horrible things happen to them. These are two stories of two completely different women in two different walks of life. One story is that of a woman who grew up in a very um, divided home. Her mother had abandoned her and her sister and when they were small. Her father was abusive to them. He didn't send them to school. They were homeless. And she was finally taken and put, put into foster care and floated around through the foster care system. Didn't really have an education a very little education. Her father had not sent her to school and she was probably 10 or so before she finally did start to go to school. Um, and she just grew up with uh, limitations in life. And she chose to um, have different relationships with different men probably because she was seeking a home life, seeking love and attention and affection that she didn't get as a child. And what lifestyle choices she ended up making um, led to her demise. And the second story is a woman who grew up in a wonderful home. Uh, her parents were loving and giving and she had pretty much every opportunity that she could ask for. She grew up in a very nice neighborhood. She was active in her school. She was a college student. She made good choices in life for as, as far as what I could read about her. And um, she still ends up in a very bad situation. And so it just shows that there are there's no um, rhyme or reason to um, a murderer choosing their victims. It just shows that there's, you know, there's no one person more at risk or less at risk than another when it comes to a sadistic killer. And I just wanted to show that contrast as the telephone company laborer went to work on the morning of October the 4th, 1978, little did he know he would make a discovery that would instigate one of Iowa's most heart-wrenching mysteries. The worker was laying cable along Highway 182 in Lyon County near Rock Rapids in the far northwest corner of Iowa. In the course of his work, he found more than a few dead lines. The skeletal remains of a half-naked woman lay in a ditch along the north side of a gravel road approximately one mile from the Rock Rapids School. Her identity remained a mystery for more than 27 years. The victim was later identified in 2006 as 23-year-old Wilma Neeson. Over 45 years after her murder, investigators believe they know one of the people responsible but they do not have enough evidence to make an arrest. Learning Wilma Neeson's identity was as heartbreaking as discovering her remains because much of her life was nearly as bad as her death. In January of 2006, a Des Moines lab technician matched the woman's left thumbprint to one that had been sent to various labs from Los Angeles. 
After over 27 years, the woman in the ditch finally had a name, Wilma June Neeson. Sadly, she had not had much of a life. Wilma was born in San Francisco in 1954 to Charles and June Neeson. Her younger sister, Mona, was deaf and unable to speak. Wilma's mother abandoned her children when Wilma was eight, and her father abused his daughter. While he was at work, Wilma and Mona were locked in a closet. After Charles was fired from his job, the young girls moved from the closet to the car. Mona was confined most of the day, while Wilma was sent out into the streets to look for food. Wilma never attended school and could not read or write. In 1964, after the state of California removed the children from their father's care, they spent the remainder of their youth bouncing around different foster homes. Perhaps, perhaps predictably, as she became a young adult, the uneducated and desperate Wilma resorted to prostitution. Wilma married twice and had three children with three different men. Now, she did not marry her first son's father, but she did marry her second son's father. And then she had a daughter named Chrissy with her second husband. All the children were given up for adoption. Chrissy, having been adopted by Wilma, now Chrissy was her daughter, the youngest. She was adopted by Wilma's final set of foster parents. In February of 1978, shortly after Wilma left Robert Ir Irvin, who was her last husband, she is believed to have traveled to San Diego, where she met 54-year-old Charles Belt. The two traveled together to visit Charles's mother in Atlanta, Georgia. Belt said Wilma left the residence several days later without telling him. He believed she was planning to try to hitchhike back to California. Eight months later, human remains identified as Wilma's over 27 years later were found in the ditch in northwest Iowa. Charles Belt was the last person known to have seen her alive. He left the country and moved to Tijuana, Mexico. Investigators believe Wilma was placed in the Lyon County ditch in either June or July of 1978 three or four months before her remains were discovered. She was naked from the waist up, and her feet were tied together with a braided hemp rope. Wilma had clearly been murdered, but the specific manner was undetermined. Two of her front teeth had been pulled. The rest, along with her lower, lower jawbone and her clothing and other belongings, were never found. For a time, Robert Rhodes, a.k.a. the truck stop killer, was a suspect in the murder of Wilma Neeson. He had been convicted of rape and three counts of murder in Illinois and is suspected of murdering over 50 women from 1975 to 1990. Rhodes lived in Sioux Falls, Iowa in 1978, but investigators say they have ruled him out as Wilma's killer. In August of 2009, another suspect emerged when 82-year-old John Van Gameron was charged with six counts of perjury after lying to authorities regarding transporting strippers and prostitutes from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, into Iowa to his home. The ditch where Wilma was found was not too far from his home. The charges against him were dismissed. Seven years later, in 2016, investigators announced they believe they know one of the people involved in the murder of Wilma. Detectives believe that after leaving Atlanta sometime between February and April 1978, Wilma made her way to northwest Iowa. Wilma was known to have been in the company of a known prostitute and escort who worked for the same company. In the summer of 1978, investigators say several Lyon County residents attended sex parties in the western part of the county near the South Dakota border. Both Wilma and this woman were working as dancers, escorts, and prostitutes at these parties. Police believe Wilma was killed at one of the parties and that robbery was the motive. 
Lyon County investigators believe that this woman, who went by the name Sugar, is one of several people involved in Wilma's murder. Police have conducted several interviews with her. They know her true identity and where she currently lives. Wilma is buried in Rock Rapids Riverview Cemetery. Her short and tortured life ended with her brutal death in rural Iowa. She had no connection to the area other than the people she met up with there. A $10,000 reward is offered for information leading to an, an arrest and conviction of the persons responsible for Wilma's death. If you have any information, you can contact the Lyon County Sheriff's Office at 712-472-8300. She was unrecognizable when she was found due to decomposition. The body had lay in the ditch on the North Gravel Road, one and a half miles from the school. She went under the name Our Girl or Jane Doe for almost three decades. So now her body was being exhumed. This article was written in 2007. I'm going to see if I can find anything more updated on this. But it just says that she, um, they were hoping that once her body was exhumed, that it might lead to more clues about how she died. And um, they were planning on doing some forensics. Now, the girls were taken from their father and placed in foster care. They were moved around from home to home, as many foster children are. Once she got 18 and was no longer in foster care and not having any way to really support herself, she turned to prostitution and dancing. She began to move around from place to place and hitchhiked. And she went by the street name or the, or the name of Boots. She moved to Georgia with her last husband, who was much older than she was. Um... He was the last known person to see her alive. Now, it's said that he told authorities that he took her to the home of his mother and that she left hitchhiking. Is it possible that he he went to the home of his mother, but she never made it that far? And that he may have killed her and placed her body in this ditch? In the 1978 autopsy report, a medical examiner noted the dislocation of her right elbow and a possible dislocation of her cervical vertebrae that may have occurred after death. He believes that she fought off who was trying to kill her and he believes there may be DNA under her finger, fingernails. They were planning to exhume her body he believes that she had been sexually assaulted because her underwear and pants were oddly on one leg and they were wrapped around her ankle as though someone had tried to remove them. He believes that she tried to fight this person off and it turned violent. Investigators describe the crime scene. They say that her face was unrecognizable, her lower jaw was missing, and she only had two teeth remaining in her skull. Um, none of her clothing or other items were found other than the paints and underwear that she wore. They described the crime scene. A woman lies face down in a grassy ditch approximately 20 feet from a gravel road. Tall weeds conceal her decaying body. She is wearing light green denim paints bikini-style underwear, white patent leather calf-length boots, and a silver ring with a gold indentation on her right ring finger. She is naked from the waist up. Her feet are tied together with a braided hemp rope. A crime scene um, search team searched the road and the surrounding area for any other belongings, but nothing was ever found. Today, Neeson's remains will tell the story of how she died and who killed her. 
No evidence is present at the crime scene except her body, clothing, a rope, and the position of her body. He believes the rope was used to pull her into the ditch. So he believes that the killer tied this rope around her legs and used it to pull her um, instead of trying to pick her up and carry her body. He believes that's the reason why her arms and her hands come forward and her hair is forward. She's face down. Um, the body had been drugged by the feet into the ditch. So now, in this story, which was in 2007, they were planning to exhume her body and do some more forensics, such as DNA. I don't know if it ever says. In the basement of the Lyon County Sheriff's Office, the investigator slides a pair of blue latex gloves over his hands. He opens the freezer door and removes a package wrapped in crinkled white paper. His footsteps echo as he walks to a makeshift table and unfolds a stained pair of torn pants that Wilma Neeson was wearing the night she was found dead laying in the ditch. Although evidence personal to the killer was washed away from the crime scene by the rain and wind, investigators hope that there will be some traces of the killer's DNA on her clothing and her body. The odds of finding a biological blueprint of the killer will depend on the condition of her remains. How she came to end up in Iowa is still somewhat unknown because she was less known to have been in Georgia and then she was found murdered in Iowa sometime later. And it took many years for them to identify her, but it kind of stops there in about 2007. There's some podcasts and things about her, but there's nothing really telling whether or not DNA ever was matched to anyone. And I will continue to look for more on her case, and if I find anything, I will come back and follow up. This is from 2021. Last fall, one of South Carolina's most famous missing person cases was thrust back into the limelight with speculation swirling as to an alleged person of interest involved in the unsolved 1992 disappearance of Dale Dinwiddie of Columbia, South Carolina. This case is still unsolved. September the 24th, 1992, Dale Dinwiddie, a 23-year-old college student attending the University of South Carolina in Columbia was living at home with her parents and younger brother when she decided to attend a U2 concert with her friends. Everything went well that night, and after the concert, her friends went to the Five Points area, which was an area where a lot of college students hung out. There were bars and restaurants and that type of thing in the area. They ended up at one of their favorite restaurants or bars called Jungle Gems. They spent the evening there, and at some point they became separated. Dale was looking for her friends, and they were searching for her, and they couldn't find her, so they went ahead and left, hoping that maybe they would meet up with her later. Later that night, a bouncer recalls having about a 15-minute conversation with Dale where she asked him had he seen her friends. He told her no, that he hadn't seen them. Witnesses recall Dale was not intoxicated. They said, as, in fact, she was, seemed to be clear-headed. She was drinking casually, sitting at the bar, having a drink, but she did not appear to be intoxicated or anything like that. For those of you unfamiliar with the state's capital city, Five Points is a hip dining and shopping district located just east of the city's center. At night, its bars become a hub of the nightlife scene. There are favorite drinking destinations of the nearby students at the University of South Carolina. 
In recent years, Five Points has become known as an increasingly dangerous place in the evenings. But back in the 1990s, it was a safe environment. At around 1.15 a.m., Dale asked a bouncer whether he had seen her friends. He told her no, that he had not. Fifteen minutes later, the brown-eyed, brown-haired young woman who was only five foot tall and weighed around 100 pounds, exited the bar. Walking north on Hardin Street, wearing a green pullover, faded jeans, and a blue L.L. Bean jacket tied around her waist. No one has seen or heard from her since. The next morning, Dale's father noticed his daughter was not in her room when he woke up to let the family dog out. He started to call some of her friends to see if she had slept over with someone. Theories abound as to what may have happened to her that night. Police have chased down thousands of tips and leads over the years. A victim of a reported sexual assault communicated a possible lead in the case to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. The victim told law enforcement that the man who allegedly assaulted her remarked on how she reminded him of Dale Dinwiddie. Now they're saying that the person who made this remark was politically connected South Carolina attorney and former state director, uh, state accident fund director, Harry Gregory. Now, he was the same man whose home was raided last Thursday morning by police in connection with an ongoing child sex investigation. Gregory has been charged with multiple counts of committing lewd acts on a minor. Um, and it just goes on to talk a little bit about his case. This was in 2021. Law enforcement told sources at the time that they did not consider him a suspect in Dinwiddie's disappearance. While not discounting the story of the victim who came forward that she was assaulted by this man, they just say that they just don't think that there was anything to link him to Dale Dinwiddie's disappearance. Gregory is certainly well known around town for seeking the attention of younger women. All this, although this hardly makes him unique, he's a 60-year-old man who likes to hang out with and get the attention of young girls such as 20-year-olds. Now, he talks a whole lot about this Gregory guy here in his life and his marriage and the people that he was associated with, he was well known, um, but they don't really think that he had anything to do with Dale's disappearance. Some people believe that he did because it was reported that at the time of her disappearance, his home was only a few blocks away from where her parents lived. And they think that it's possible that she may have made it almost to her home when she encountered this man. He may have seen her walking as he was driving. He may have stopped and offered her a ride. And knowing that he lived in the same neighborhood, she may have accepted this ride. It was also said by some people that knew him that he liked to go and hang out in the Five Points District where he knew that he would come into contact with younger women. He, he was well known around Jungle Gyms, which was the bar that she was last seen at. Um, he was known by the bartenders at the establishment. And... Um, all of the speculation connecting him to Dale's disappearance is just that, pure speculation. Police have never been able to verify anything that anyone has told them, and they've never been able to connect him to her directly. Now, 
Many have speculated that Dale may have been abducted by someone she knew, or at least someone who had been stalking her. Now, this guy, this Gregory guy that they were speaking about, he was well known to frequent these bars and especially this jungle gyms. Was there ever any evidence that he was there that night? Did anyone say he was there that night? Anyone else remember seeing him? He did live in the same neighborhood as her. And is it possible that he had come to that bar that night, spotted her, realizing that she was from his neighborhood maybe it was someone that he knew and had watched maybe he had been watching her since she was a younger girl keep in mind this is one more case just like the brooklyn farthing case brooklyn farthing was a very t petite girl she was five foot and weighed about 100 pounds the same as this girl this makes their appearance makes them appear much younger and these men who were attracted to younger children, younger girls, maybe saw them. And even though they knew that they were 18, 19, 20, still saw their bodies and saw their appearance as much younger. And this attracted them to these women. This is just speculation. But he may have been involved. There's nothing to say that he was, but there's also nothing to say that he wasn't. At the time of her disappearance, the Five Points region was not blanketed with surveillance cameras. There was not a heavy police presence in this area at this time. Now, you would have thought that being that they had just had this rock concert, this band U2, and after the concert lets out, people are going to go to the bars. You would think there would have been some cops around patrolling the area for people getting into their vehicles after having too much to drink, maybe some fighting or something like that going on. All we can say for certain is that a beautiful young woman who had her whole life ahead of her vanished without a trace. She left behind her family and friends in agony, decades passing without anyone knowing her fate. According to Tommy Crosby, public information officer for the South Carolina law enforcement, the case is still active. We do have tips that continue to come in to this day, he says. Investigators have explored major leads, including a potential lead in connection with Ronaldo Ray Rivera, who was on George's death row for killing four women, including a police officer. He attended the University of South Carolina at the time that Dale Dinwiddie was uh, attending, or, or at the time that, her, that she disappeared. He admitted to the Georgia killings. He never admitted to having any connection to Dale, and police were never able to find any connection to him. Police followed more than a thousand leads, but there was no crime scene and very few clues to go on. Columbia Police Department and her family put together a reward of $20,000 for any information that may solve her case. And anyone with any information can contact 1-888-CRIMESC.